themed or <laughs> Welcome everyone. I'd like to call the May 10th, 2022 Travel Council Advisory Board meeting to order. Um, first off, if there's any conflicts of interest, closures. Um, citizens to be heard. Um, uh, um, and then also presentations next. Introduction. Well, yeah, Kate, mm -hmm. you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. Or do we want to do introduction? Well, yeah. We need to walk in the room. Go around? <laughs> yeah, I can start making the wrap up. My name is Kate Thomas, and I'm a public affairs specialist for the Southeast Utah Group of National Parks. Ben Alter, Economic Development Specialist with Grand County. Ego Metzner, Moab to Monument Valley Film Commission -er with Grand County. <laughs> 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 Robert Riveria, Assistant Marketing Director for the Travel Council. My name is Staff, I'm Assistant Marketing Director for Travel Council. Mm -hmm. Sharon Kinsley, um, Travel Council Board Member. Jay Hudson, Travel Council Board Member. Chair. Alex Gorishevsky, Travel Council Board Member, owner of the Spock Sushi and Ivy Center. August Grant, Economic Development Director, Green County. Mary McGann, uh, Grand County Commission. Jason Taylor, Travel Council Board Member. Dylan Jones, Moab City Council Liaison. Tracy Shumway, I'm the Director of the Mount Jay Reformers and the Travel Council Board Member. I'm Chanel Marinese, a Travel Council Board Member. And Rachel Bartlett, Economic Development Administrator for Response. And now I can get my lovers. <laughs> that leaves Daniel and Zoom land. Daniel Leverage, uh, Travel Council Board Member. Okay. Anything else? Um, great. And then next into presentations. Perfect. All right, so uh, I'm here to just give an update on time entry and how that's going at Urcha so far and uh, didn't prepare anything too fancy. Everything's still very preliminary at this point. We don't have a lot of data, but I'll share with you uh, what I can. And first off, the initial implementation just went exceptionally well and it went so well. It was so smooth the first three days that we increased our hourly allocations so that we could try to maximize visitors into the park. Um, and something that we've noticed is that in the mornings, all of our models suggested that we would get hundreds of vehicles entering the park before 6 a.m., but we are not seeing that right now. So that's why we kind of bumped up our morning allocations. Uh, to try to balance things out a little bit. But because of that, um, you know, we're, we're wondering what's going to happen over Memorial Day when things get a little bit warmer. Are we going to see more people trying to gain the system come in a little bit earlier? Um, we're not really sure, but we did bump up our morning allocations just a, a little bit to make up for the gap that we saw in vehicle entries um, on a daily basis. And then in the afternoon, we do see a surge, but it's not a really big one. It's, it's manageable. So there are a lot of vehicles coming into the park after about 445, 5 o'clock. And those folks, um, you know, we're, we're letting them in because the time entry period is, is over. But um, again, it's, it's really manageable. So I think it's a good problem to have. We're, we're definitely seeing levels that are easy for us to manage. And we um, bumped up our afternoon numbers because we have a a pretty sizable no-show rate. I don't have the exact numbers, but between 4 and 5 p.m., there's quite a few no-shows. So folks that, for whatever reason, they canceled or they just didn't decide to, to come. So maybe in future years, if we did implement this as part of a, a planning process, we would maybe stop at 4 p.m. rather than 5 p.m., just based on the no-shows that we're seeing uh, so far. And that, that's always a good carrot to get people to. The earlier they can get in. The, the better. Um, I would suggest that folks inform your businesses that tickets are not that difficult to acquire. We've actually had some openings uh, all day long on certain days. So like on 
a random Tuesday afternoon, for example, you might actually have 20 or 30 tickets from 2 to 5 p.m. So just let folks know if they're panicked, like, oh, I didn't get a, an early reservation. We, we do seem to have some availability in the afternoons, especially on weekdays. So just have that in your back pocket. Um, and because we aren't seeing those high numbers before and after the reservation period, we do expect that our visitation will go down a little bit from last year. I can't tell you exactly how much that's going to be, but we were already on a downward trend. And you'll see when you look at this um, stat sheet that Ben put together, you flip over to the backside. For January through March of 2022, Arches was already down 7.78%, and Canyonlands was down over 10% from the previous year. So we were already seeing a downward trend before time entry was implemented. Um, and when we get those April numbers, I will let all of you know and I'll share what those are. We just don't have it quite yet, but I would expect it to be down a little bit so that, you know, if you're thinking about uh, Arches numbers, I don't want to have any surprises or anything, but we probably will be down a little bit once we get those April values. Um, as far as visitor satisfaction goes, Visitors are absolutely loving the system once they get into the park. So we have, I think as of yesterday, over 1,500 reviews on recreation.gov. I'm really surprised that many people have reviewed it already. Like people are really going to town on these uh, reviews. But we have four and a half stars out of five, and there's some really positive reviews. I have one to share with you. Um, that just talks about their experience from several years ago to what it's like now. And in their review, they wrote, we went to Arches several years ago and spent half of our time circling parking lots and trying to get through crowds on the trails to the point that we couldn't fit on one of the trails that we had planned to hike. This time, it was a completely different experience. We never had to wait for parking. The trails were busy, but not unpleasantly so, and we thoroughly enjoyed the visit. The only lines were for the drinking water at Landscape Arch and the bathrooms, <laughs> I like this part, in parentheses, which were remarkably clean. <laughs> so, that's always good. And we are super happy with the tiny entry and Arches National Park itself is of course breathtaking. So I thought that, that was really fun. I just wanted to share with you. But there's there's yeah over a thousand reviews that are quite similar to that. So I think people are really enjoying the system once they get in. But our biggest complaint is line length. So I told you we did bump up our allocations because we were trying to hit those target values without the, the early morning visitation or the late afternoon visitation that we're just not getting. But that has made the line wait uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes in the morning and then 45 minutes or so in the afternoon. So we are getting some complaints on that, but what we've been trying to tell visitors is that this is so much better than it used to be. So yes, you are waiting for 45 minutes in line. Yes, that does feel painful, but that's better than two hours and then not getting in. So I think that even though it seems long, it's still remarkably shorter than it used to be. And uh, we're just trying to share that with people that yes, 45 minutes might seem like a while, but you're getting into the park and that's the most important thing. Um, so I think besides that, um, the only other thing that we're facing is maybe some infrastructure issues. You know, we wish that we had a roundabout that was in front of the booths rather than after the entrance booths because it is a little sad turning people around after they have been waiting in that line for so long, but we really uh, had a pretty low turnaround rate. Um, we're talking 150 vehicles a day, which is very, very low considering that we're looking at 1,700 tickets right now. So we're um, at about... 10% or less turnaround rate, which is really remarkable because Glacier, Rocky Mountain, they had 30% turnaround rates. So we're doing really, really well with that. And um, I think other than that, we're just gonna truck along. And you know, I think another challenge we're facing is stack morale because it is a new system. So we're just trying to modify and adapt our operations just to keep our staff happy and keep them safe as well. So everybody's out there wearing high vis vests and we have ice water for them. We're trying to get shade structures that don't blow down. That's been pretty <laughs> hard the past couple of days, but we're doing what we can to keep our staff happy so that we can keep the visitors happy. And that's about it. So any questions?
I actually had a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if people are, don't show up for their time slot, you don't open those up as, as, a, as like a here. Mm -hmm. Actually, we just have these people didn't show up. We have 50 mm -hmm. tickets. Put them down. If they cancel, we do. So they have to go on to recreation.gov to cancel, though. So uh, that, that's kind of a trick that we haven't quite figured out. You know, how can we adapt this? Because they have to cancel for those tickets to become available. Okay. Yeah. But you said you did increase the number available we did. to call in that day because mm -hmm. of the no-shows. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So we, we um, it's very variable. So some, some hours we have maybe a 1% no show rate and other hours we have a 15% or a 20% no show rate. So it's really all across the board. So we've actually adjusted our hourly allocations in a really weird pattern to try to compensate for that. How many tickets are available each day? Right now it's about 1700. We the, the modeling planned for 2,700 vehicles per day, but that was factoring in the early morning arrivals and the late afternoon arrivals, and we're not seeing that. So it's it's strange. It's like people are are wanting to follow the rules or something. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, we're not sure what's going to happen this summer. We do expect that when we start seeing temperatures in the hundreds, that people are going to come in earlier. So we haven't gone too crazy with increasing the morning allocations just because we're not sure when that wave is finally going to hit but um, but we are looking at it daily have you seen a lot of uptick in the willow springs area uh, not yet that's actually. good so okay. it is good can you buy um the park entry on or just the ticket to get in you right now you can just buy the national parks pass okay. and the ticket to get in the daily entrance fee um, rocky mountain had an awful lot of um, problems where folks were buying multiple entrance passes even though they only needed one so if they were visiting the park for multiple days they were buying two, three entrance passes and charging themselves 90 bucks when really they only needed to pay 30. So we took that option out so that people didn't accidentally pay more than they, they should. So it is still good for a few days then mm -hmm. or for a week? Or it is. Too? Yeah, so you could get, like if you bought three separate days of time entry tickets, you only need one entrance pass and that covers all three days. How's it going with the um, <clears throat> sea waves and tour buses and stuff? Uh, I think very well. It seems like they're getting in. I haven't heard any complaints. Um, you know, we, we've had a few folks that didn't have sea waves that tried to get in without them. Uh, so we've had some issues with that, but by and large, it's been going pretty well. But I mean, like the commercial trips that they, hey, we're a commercial trip. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you don't actually have sea waves. Yeah, there, there's been a couple of folks that, yeah, that didn't get their sea way, but said, hey, I'm a commercial group, can we get in? And it's like, oh, no, <laughs> I have to fill out the paperwork first. Did we ever get the answer to that motorcycle question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, it, one one pass per motorcycle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really like, well, we could put four motorcycles in a parking mm -hmm. spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the tickets are for a vehicle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not per person. Kate, I have a question. Today someone called me and say that I don't know, this is a Chinese lady. So what I could at the rest time she said that she made her reservation mm -hmm. and she got an email. So that does she need to show that email? Mm -hmm. Because she said that in her email said that you need to go to the visitor information center to have your ticket. Yes. So so if um, she could either print off the email or she can show it on her cell phone, as long as that QR code is visible, that's all we need. It's but why you say go to the visitor information center? That's what uh, she's saying. So I, no, I wonder if that was a, that might have been a fire furnace. That might, yeah, that was, that was probably a fire, fire furnace, furnace permit. Because the, the, the Maybe furnace, she did wrong, yeah, fire furnace permit, you have to yeah. do that. Well, have that Oh, to you go, go to the arches. arches. You go to the neck or arches. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because gotcha. it, it have, you have to have orientation before you go in. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? I don't know if you know this off the top of your head, but this um, 2021, so we're, we're down 7.78% for 2022. Mm -hmm. Was it up in 2021? Like, it, where, are, where are we sitting in comparison to years prior? Yeah, in, in 2021, I think we were up something really ridiculous, like 13% or, you know, it was pretty high. Okay. So I think that we were looking like we're getting back closer to 2018, 2019. Yeah. And, that's and actually we've seen that downward trend i think since september of 2021 so we've been um anywhere from negative three to negative seven percent in a given year how does it work um if you have a time entry like three to four and people are lined up, but so they get there like 240 and they get to the gate a little bit earlier. Like how it's, it's like, is there like a good <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, it's a secret? <laughs> yeah. Um because these people are asking us what to do. Um yeah, it it totally will be fine. It, we we don't advertise it, but yeah. the those tickets work for several minutes before the, the hourly period and then a little bit after as well. So are you seeing a lot of people lined up like right before a certain time slot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, at the top of the hour, you see a lot of, a lot of vehicles coming. Do you have a time set time you're supposed to stay in the park or leave? Um, or once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, you're in as long as you want, and you can re enter as long as you validate it at the correct time. So, as long as you, you know, if you had a 10 a.m. ticket, as long as you showed up sometime between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And you went through the booth, you got validated, then you can come and go for the rest of the day. And that's part of the reason why our afternoon line length is so long, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of people going back to town and you know, grabbing lunch, going shopping, and then coming back into the park. So that's part of our line issue. Yeah. Is there any move to go with uh, the time entry at Candy at all? Not yet. So that would have to be its own separate planning process. So we haven't even started on that. So it'd still be the two years out if we did it. Is there a little bit of talk about it? It's it's a consideration, but I don't, you know, I don't see it happening for, for a while. Do you know if this trend is kind of like statewide or how are other national parks? Uh, we have seen Bryce, Capitol Reef. Um, Zion only dropped 1%, but Bryce and Capital B were more like 3 4%. So they, they are also on a little bit of a downward trend. Um, but Zion, yeah, is only down 1% from last year. So they're still really good. Yeah. Can I I think that they have a formula. So you know, it, there's through traffic, it goes right. through. The, I've just never been stopped. But. Yeah, so I think that what they do is they have a traffic counter and then they have an equation that okay. approximates who's actually. I saw like they have like a little camera, like a little traffic mm -hmm. that people pass. Yeah. I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next, report. We have a lot. That's true. Can you, can you stick around? Or yeah, I can stick around. Okay. Um, just later, there's a discussion maybe with the EMS signage. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, if you have to allow me to share the page of the host. <laughs> Yeah. 
<clears throat> okay, I kind of wanted to start um, doing a bit more of a word with a little bit more just context and bring that into the meeting flow. I know that Elaine did that before, um, but you know, I think the meeting before this is where most like here are the things we need to talk about this month with Dr. Wong. And so trying to provide a little bit more insight into the operations of the office, the things that are happening in the county that are relevant to this office. Etc. So I'm just going to kind of hop through this and feel free to stop any questions that you have on. A um, couple of things I'm going to go over today are county commission actions in the last two meetings relevant to this body, a survey that the Utah Office of Tourism put out, um, asking questions statewide and in local um, communities about how they what they feel about tourism. Um, a bit of an update, um, partly this was requested by a handful of people just to see where we are in our advertising spend so far this year and what, what's in the pipeline, where are we at. Um, another update on kind of following through with that conversation about the Cooperative Marketing Grant Program, uh, the I-70 billboard, um, a little update on that, and um, some progress that we're making on a master plan. So uh, nothing crazy here, but at the April 19th meeting, um, the county commission approved both of the grant programs, so the small tourism business marketing grant program and the economic diversification grant program, as well as approved Alex's appointment to the board. So he's here legally. Uh, and then on May 3rd last week, um, we had put forth a consideration of consolidating the other two boards that we work with. So that's the Economic Diversification Advisory Board and the Economic Development Advisory Board, excuse me, Advisory Council, that's this year. Um, and kind of got some feedback um, indicating that we wanted to make sure that we had everyone represented on that and that we were able to carry forth the vision of both the diversification priorities and the statutory obligations in the World Bank Grant Program. Um, so we postponed that and hopefully we'll get that addressed by next meeting. Um, so this came through from the Utah Office of Tourism Partner email list, which is something that I think would be useful for everybody on this board. If you're not on it already, send me a note and I can try to get you connected to the Office of Tourism's newsletter. But this is something that they've been doing for several months. I think mainly coming out of um, their their five-year strategic plan, a bit called the Red Emerald Plan, within which they're really trying to engage communities when they're planning marketing for the state. Um, and you know, how do the how do the actual people who are in the communities that they're marketing feel about the marketing that they're doing, and how can they do a better job of ensuring that communities' voices are heard in those statewide uh, conversations? Sorry, that was a previous slide. Um, so in the statewide survey, they spoke with 406 people. So the, these numbers have a 5% margin of error. Um, handful of things that I wanted to emphasize. I'll do the, the graphic on the right first. You can't quite read this, but um, they found that 75% of Utah residents feel positively about the effect of tourism on Utah's overall reputation. They felt that 66% felt positively about the effect of tourism on job opportunities. Um, also, that 62% of residents think that tourism has a negative effect on housing affordability. Um, two that are not included in that graphic um, are that in general, 59% of Utah residents feel that positive effects outweigh the negative, and that 86% um, agree that the state and office of tourism should educate visitors on responsible visitation. So when you hear forever mighty language from the state, that's that extension from the Mighty Five program that is thinking about sustainable tourism. How can the Mighty Five be forever mighty um, and everything in between um, kind of be a part of what they're advertising and not just advertise the five national parks, but everything in between to provide a high quality visitor experience wherever people are. Um, and also making sure that these places are going to be around forever for all of the people that you know want to experience them in the future. Um, 
that we're being good stewards of the land and good partners with the communities and um, populations that live there. And so that's obviously something that we're also working on um, with our responsible recreational stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll distribute these slides. Um, they also did community surveys. So there's kind of a statewide survey and then a community level survey. So they, they surveyed pretty much every corner of the state with a specific focus on tourism heavy areas. Um, I want to highlight kind of two elements that came out of the Moab specific survey. Um, they, they surveyed 108 people, so obviously a smaller sample size, higher margin of error. Um, but even with that margin of error, these are you know, significant findings that um, I thought this was the most interesting thing, was that 88% of Moab residents felt that tourism is important to the local economy, which is the highest of any community so uh, in the state. And then we also have 59% of residents felt that tourism has declined the overall quality of life, which is also the highest of any community. So the, the report kind of singles out Moab within the context of, um, you know, we always hear this in other places, oh, I don't want to become Moab, um, kind of thinking around how do we plan tourism economies going forward so that we don't get numbers like this in other communities um, from the state's perspective. From our perspective, I just thought this was really I mean, confirming probably what we all kind of know at some level, but there's really good um, data. There's a no, there's verbatim responses. So every single response is in there, kind of get a, a, a run the gamut of all of your different opinions. Um, and so anyway, I guess I brought this up because I wanted to share this information with you all. Here's links to all of the actual reports. And if there's an appetite, Denise Jordan, who's the research manager for the State Office of Tourism, has expressed um, that she'd be more than willing to do kind of a deeper dive into this stuff and probably and pick out what she thinks is relevant for our area and you know help answer maybe some of the statistical questions that people are like, well, is this really, is this real? Is this really represent our area? Because um, they do have demographic information uh, and it's fairly representative. But if you want to look at these, they're pretty comprehensive. The, the larger reports are like 100 pages long. So there's, there's good stuff in there. Um, any questions on that before I move on? Do you know the places that it was distributed? The yeah. survey or how it was? It was distributed or yeah. was community answer asking the questions? No, how was like how was it distributed in Grand County? Was it phone calls? Was it oh, how do they reach the actual mm -hmm. survey respondents? Yeah. So we'll that okay. Okay. Like, but um, what well, was like the demographic, like the age group? So there's a there is a demographic breakdown, and I just gave it a cursory glance. It seems to be like relatively fairly representative. It's not like super biased one way or another. But again, that's something she could definitely speak to. Right. You know, we want to put, we want to, you know, if this ends up being information that we can use to do anything we want to do, we want to make sure we can something we could consider as a future agenda item just to have some discussion. <clears throat> so it's, it's pretty much every community. So in areas where there's not like a Moab, it would be like a group of counties, like Central Utah, so you know, Juab and Beaver and other counties. Um, but they had like Springdale area and Moab area, Park City and Knapp. So those are areas that are uh, our gateway community right. were heavily focused on. Um, in areas that have tourism, but it's not like the bread and butter, they captured their sentiments. So like Northeast Utah and kind of like Lisa, Daggett, and Shane, where they're trying to develop some more tourism with dinosaur land. Yeah. <clears throat> right all. Um, but it's not, you know, their primary uh, industry at the moment is you know, drill and oil exploitation. And so, you know, they had different, they had very different uh, perspectives. And so it was useful to get that compare and contrast. Um, Quick marketing spend update. So um, big picture money we've already allocated is that $200,000 to um, time to entry digital education program that Love Communications is running. That's basically, although the money's not necessarily out of our pockets yet, it's, it's all allocated going into spend. The timeline for that is about you know, focusing on this first half of the program. So come June, um, they'll be phasing down the intensity of that a tremendous amount. So really think of that as like, you know, the front half of the program. It's not going to be really running 
through the half of the summer and the end of the program at uh, our trade center. Some additional um, resources, we spend about $30,000 on various print and TV related materials with either time entry visit, visitor education focus or responsible recreation focuses. Um, and if people are curious about that, we can provide a breakdown uh, later. Uh, some money that's budgeted is, as we talked about last time, that flying visitation campaign. So again, that's $150,000 out of TRT money, matched 100% by the state. Um, I have an update on that shortly. We also have $40,000 billboard expenses budgeted that we've started to spend. Um, but that all adds up to about $422,000 allocated or planned out of a $440,000 advertising budget. So that leaves us about 18,000 kind of left that's not already allocated for something um, that I'd like to kind of leave for, you know, for some short term things that come up or opportunities that we feel uh, we want to take advantage of, but also open to input across the board. <clears throat> um, so we talked about this last time. I kind of wanted to zoom out at that one project that we're trying to put our feet together and kind of get a reminder of where we're at. So this again is the Youth Office of Tourism's Cooperative Marketing Grant Program. Um, we have two reports in progress that happened in the past that have already been completed. We need to finish those to get um, the rest of the money um, to our office. We have an RFP in progress that we talked about last time. So that's that flying visitation campaign that we decided we were gonna move forward with. So we're gonna aim for either the next commission meeting next week or the following commission meeting June 7 for approval, depending on how fast, or really what other fire they end up having to put out next week. Um, but that's in progress. The other thing that I think is important to note is that the round 2022, so that's what we applied for this summer <clears throat> that goes into next year's marketing plan, um, we applied for uh, due June 17. Um, so that that is something that we're going to be thinking about, um, and and it'll it'll come before this board at the next meeting. Uh, so, again, the timeline is they're going to start to do webinars this month. The applications are due June seventeenth. Uh, they'll do follow up interviews in person in July, and then the awards will be announced in August. <clears throat> Does everybody have a good understanding of how that program works? And uh, any questions about? So again, the June the June meeting for our office. Anyone's an extra task for you? <clears throat> Second Tuesdays. Yeah. Fourteen. Fourteen. Yeah. So by the fourteenth, we're probably going to have a final application. So I would imagine that I will probably solicit input um, via email. Um, but you know, going to lean on love. I think to help us. Mm -hmm. through. The other thing I wanted to add here is that when we talked to Love recently, they floated the idea of kind of reopening the relationship with them from a contract by contract basis to just the, to the agency of record that they've been in the past, which I think is a good idea and will allow us to spend less time going through the purchasing policy. And um, you know, we can have a multi-year agreement that has an auto opt-out or opt-in at the end of the year. So we don't have to kind of do the review in this way. Um, yeah, any, any kind of, yeah, I, I would imagine we'd either have a intermediate meeting before that happens to kind of discuss options and strategies, or we'll just present kind of final application on that 14th meeting next month. Unless anyone has any strong opinions, that's probably what I would do, do the groundwork and ask for feedback. Mm -hmm. Alex, it is. Yeah. It, so, yeah, good point. So, the, the basic high level of how it works is that the state um, has its own money that they spend on advertising the state, right? In this program, um, any DMO, such as you know the Travel Council, or like entities like the Shakespeare Festival, can apply and say, "Here's what we want to do." This fits, this fits into the larger strategy for the state, but this is our kind of community angle on it. This is what we want to do. Here's our money. 
they'll match it um, and then we spend them for the budget. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so anyway, the, I, I mentioned this because I want to have kind of those final reports done and the RFP probably awarded before that, um, before the application goes in so that we can demonstrate that we're using this program and not just sitting on the cash. Because we probably don't want to get this money from us. So that's <laughs> Um, okay, so the I-70 billboard got broken. Um, <laughs> as you can imagine, it looks worse than that. Also, I saw that. That's pretty nice. So, so anyway, you not know, high winds, etc. Yeah, have blown that out. Um, Robert has taken some. I don't know if you want to speak to this at all, Robert. Um, well, there's there's two plywood panels that have blown off. Now there's four. Yeah, now now there's four. <laughs> As we understand it, as a result, it inflated the vinyl and basically tore it off. I think the whole left side of the vinyl is gone now, isn't it? But yes. the URL yeah. is intact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so above all, respect, respect, protect. Yeah, these you know these are all part of a set. You know, the east and westbound I seventy Moab exit ones have they all have the same look as those La Truda billboards. They might. Yeah, mm -hmm. these were all approved. They're, you know, Barely a year old, you know. They're actually, other than the storm that destroyed this one, they're in remarkable shape. Um, I would hate to change one of them to something different, you know, just for consistency and marketing. You know, my suggestion would be to just repair this one. You know, if we do want to change all the billboards in I seventy, it's something we might want to consider next year. Yeah, I think so, the longer the longer that this stays up there, the worse it's going to get. I'm worried. A big part of the vinyl is going to blow it on the highway or something. You know, it could be a liability. But we've spoken with the folks that can sort of fix it. We can get it in a quote. We we have a pathway to fixing it. Yeah, the, well, with two of the panels missing, it was six hundred dollars to repair it. To replace the vinyl is eleven $1, hundred, um, and install the new one is five hundred on top of that. So we have money in the billboard budget. So we yeah, it would be a total of about twenty three hundred. Hopefully the repair costs aren't going up. <laughs> so is this a billboard that that we own if yes. we're not renting the space? Correct. Oh, okay. Yes, we pay a very small permit mm -hmm. fee every year. So it's I kind see. of a gem. It's something we really don't want to let yeah, go because so. they're very hard to get on I-70. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it needs to be repaired fairly quickly. <laughs> and this is the westbound coming from Junction? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that in case people are bothering me and saying, hey, the billboard broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the one you can see in the background is actually before I started here 23 years ago, um, we used to paint the billboards. We would send a guy out there, he'd hang on a little <laughs> he'd hang on ropes and rope to literally paint the design on there. And that's, well, that's what's left there. It seems to have lasted a long time. It did. Yeah. Maybe we should do it again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Um, Okay, so the master plan often discussed, often put on the back burner. Um, we have a really great consultant, Noah Kornblut, who is related, um, works for the World Community Assistance Corporation. Uh, we were originally thinking of working with them to do some entrepreneurial um, like workshop training stuff, but it turns out that they, during that process, got a grant that they could provide technical assistance for many things. And, uh, pivoted away from that and, and realized that she can help us think through like what is really, what do we really want from the master plan? What does a master plan look like? Do we actually need a strategic plan rather than a master plan? And um, kind of helping up with step one, which is clarifying the scope of work before we go out and get a consultant and have them work us through a whole exercise. And, and then we end up with a bunch of numbers that no one reads. And it's a waste of time. So what I really want to get out of this are questions like, you know, what do we really want to be when it comes to tourism? What does diversification look like? And what are the strategies um, that our office does? Who are the partners that we're working on on these things? And uh, the RFP is simply laying out the, the game plan. And I, I want this to be a lot of community engagement, um, stakeholder engagement. Um, Really get to get to a point where you know I feel like I have a pretty clear mandate and can point to goals and objectives and strategies when we're going to the budget session and we're going to speak to the community. Um, but logistically, she 
police coming into town for um, what we've scheduled to be the first meeting of that consolidated body next Thursday, although that, that doesn't quite exist yet. Let's just consider it the Economic Development Board meeting. Uh, I would say that if anybody's really interested in uh, providing input into the RFP for a master plan, more than welcome to participate in that meeting. She's going to stay with us as staff for the following day to finish drafting. Any questions there? Are you going to send that invite? Do that. Yeah. Alex, do you have anything as of yet as far as the plan? We have a so, so two things that exist is that under um, Zachariah, they put together a draft economic development plan. It's kind of like you know, more than just a playground. Um, so that was in 2018, I think. Um, and that was all staff made. So I don't think like here's where the direction should be. So there wasn't like any engagement or it wasn't ratified by the commission. Um, and then um, Chris Wells uh, worked with Chris Wells and consulted to put together an economic diversification action plan. So those are things that exist. That one actually got approved by the commission, but again, did go through like a process. So does exist, but they haven't they haven't been able to provide the half of it. We can we can send copies of those out if people are interested as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's just again. That's a week. That's a, that's a. Um, next, on to discussion action items. Um, approval of the April 12th um, meeting minutes. May I have a motion to approve the April 12th minutes? Motion that we approve those April 12th minutes. My second. That's so easy. You always motion. You always second. <laughs> <laughs> Today was an overview of the current program as it is on our website, as it is live. Um, a status report on the grants that we approved last year, where we're at, and then I think next steps for the program. So, as it is currently written, um, the purpose of the event advertising grant is that um, is, is to provide assistance to new and existing organizations to aid in development of tourism during the months of November, December, January, and February. The purpose is to increase the level of tourism in Grant County through creating new, enlarging, existing, and encouraging events that could become annual events by providing additional funds for advertising purposes. Uh, the goal is um, to create uh, funding to be used as seat money, new events to help develop annual events that bring more tourists to Grant County, Eligible events um, um, to any individual company, nonprofit work, basically anything that is real, um, whether it's first time or fledgling event, could include but not limited to races, festivals, dramatic events. A handful of important stipulations. So uh, it's currently structured that you'd apply in the August of a given year for events like the following year. The events must be longer than a day in total duration. Okay, again, taking place in those months. 
Um, they should aim to become recurring and financially sustainable in five years. So I think the instinct is that seed money becomes sustainable. We don't want to fund it after five years. Mm -hmm. um, there's favor given to quote unquote green practices. Um, uh, it requires that the, uh, the, the recipient attends a marketing session, travel council staff. Um, it requires a 100% match. So if we give you $1,000, you have to match it to $1,000 with a minimum of 50% being cash. Um, interesting how we came up with that same structure for our other grants and I didn't even look at this one. So yeah. on the same page. Um, the, one of the more important things is as written, 100% of the grant and the match must be spent on advertising. Uh, and that 70% percent, percent, percent must be spent outside of grant. Um, and then the structure is that 50% is dispersed up front with another 50% um, dispersed upon completion of the final report. So again, this is everything that's already in the program. Relevant links that we can discuss at another time. Where we're at with the, with the grants we approved last year. So in, in the September meeting, we approved funds for the 2021 Folk Fest. Um, this was out of step with the, like the existing program timeline because uh, during the 2021, during the 20, August 2020 review, so the 2021 year, obviously that was in COVID times. And so they had not applied for the 2021 best of the time, being unsure if it was actually going to happen. So then the following year came in out of kind of synchronicity with the usual timeline there. And that's when they applied. And then they also applied for this year's Folk Fest. So that's kind of right on schedule in August for the following year, approved at December's meeting. And then um, also the free concert series for this year um, was approved at the December meeting. It is well considered kind of within the normal timeline in August. So the total disbursement is $36,700 for all three of those events. Um, where are we at? So that has not been dispersed. Um, and why is that? It's because as I've been kind of probing the, the kind of uh, administration's office saying hey, can we get this approved, um, it's been pointed out that some of this doesn't fit with the program as it's written. Um, and I think that we, as a body, kind of consider those things to say, well, we think this matters and we should approve this. Mm -hmm. And the main takeaway is I think that uh, county administration wants us to change the program guidelines um, or make it allow it to and allow these. Um, fund disbursements. So I'll talk about that as the next step. But the 2022 Folk Fest has should have no problem. That was like on 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 schedule, on time, fits perfectly. They're spending it as as it's written. I don't know if we're doing you know mandatory marketing meetings. I don't know when the last time Robert, do you have any idea when the last time that happened? I don't know since I've been here. So well, suffice it to say there's some things that are maybe out of date in the current grant program. Um, and then, um, yeah, then the free concert series is during the summer. So with the, in, which is outside of the calendar, but the intention is that this is something that gives back to the community that provides kind of relief, if anything, to the workforce during the tourism season uh, as an element of why this is something that matters. Um, as a result of not spending, dispersing these in 2021, we have to disperse it out of the 2022 budget which shouldn't be a problem. Um, we allocated 55 grand for this program in the tourism promotion side of things. So that would have to be kind of advertising oriented. We also allocated 40 grand to quote, establishing recreation film and convention resources. So that could be, you know, if the free concert series is, is it's more operational costs, for example, rather than advertising, maybe that money actually comes out of a new program that we create that's coming out of that budget line rather than the $65 million line. Uh, Kaylin, you had a question? Yeah. Great. <laughs> so <clears throat> is the commission maybe suggesting we rewrite some of, like, some of what it means, like, so we can go beyond just November, December, January? I, and that we put language in there saying if it is a benefit to the community along with visitors that we, we need to take a look at that because the community i mean we 
do need to get back there to the to, like a with a free concert service. Yeah. So is, is that what they're kind of looking for us to do? Or yeah, so next steps. Um so I think the question is first and foremost, I think we approved these, but that's to be funded in the way that we want them to be funded. So we just I think the first step is making that happen. So yeah. Uh, the Commission Administrator's Office wants us to kind of do some revising to the grant program document, then we'll go ahead and do that. Um, and you know, we bring that back to the point and kind of make that work. Um, then getting it on the Commission agenda and actually getting it approved for disbursement effect. I think that's pretty straightforward. I think the bigger question is what do we want this program to be going forward uh, at this time when planning if it's within the Existing program structure, solicit applications, consider them in August, and then that would go into the budget request for 2023. Uh, it sounds like the couple things to think through. Uh, we're not taking any action on this today, but I just kind of want to do a discussion. Like, what what do we really want to be boosting? Do we want to be boosting visitation in those four months, or do we want to be looking throughout the year and looking at okay, we've got really peak kind of month weekends here and there, but maybe there's this consistently always down weekend that's in the middle of the season. Thinking that way rather than this kind of like four month block is the only time we're going to get this program. Uh, should we be thinking about you know how far do we want to push the you know, is there a point I think it's a come up with the master plan conversation, but as a community, I think we do feel the benefit of the balance. So trying to figure out how do we not antagonize our community and say, well, we're going to start to promote like all the way up until Christmas or whatever, and figure out do we want to establish like a cutoff? Uh, or you know, those are the kinds of things. And we, even if this is the venue for that, the, the, the event manager is part of that. But I kind of see it as one track of this is a tool that has been effective at. Increasing visitation, and I think we can make it more visitation we want during the times that we want, and then separate it and have a second program that's like community event support, you know, making stuff happen in the community we want. We kind of just make those two separate programs. Open forum. Any thoughts? Did the commission say why they why it didn't fit? Well, Mallory just read a grant application oh. and she was like, oh, the proof things that don't no, no program. So I don't think it's a huge deal, but you know, I think it matters at some level if we're advertising this is how the grant works, and then we're getting money out in a way that's like not eligible within that grant. And either make it really clear when we bring this to the commission that we thought of it through X, Y, Z reasons. Well, that's why I was wondering that we did a pretty good job of saying. You know, reading the grant requirements and trying to fit that stuff into the you know, saying, right. oops, that's good, you know. So, so I'm just wondering if it's like a matter of interpretation or if it's um, right. on the slide just before this, do you mean have some reasons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said like folk festival didn't do this type of time, but I thought yeah, there was a time, of, time, of, time, of, time of, of year, time of So, so, and I think that there's there's a potential that. Like, I was just kind of in the middle of reaching out for it today, and I was like, oh, bring it here. I think there's a potential that we don't need to rewrite it. We can just get this approved with the fact that we just said these things, these are reasons, they're documented in the minutes. This is why we want to make this money happen. Not like just rewrite it going forward. I, I agree with you, Randy. I mean, that, that is an antiquated program. Yeah. 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 You know, back then we needed people coming in. But our season, our shoulder seasons are getting shorter and shorter. Yeah. Right. Um, so I mean, we can probably benefit other times of the year. I think I, I think like what we came up with with the weekends or yeah. You know, I mean, we can look at the star August. reports and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We're saying what are these key weekends and, and weeks and then using this as a program to mm -hmm. strategically boost the There's a whole lot of events that don't happen in the summer. Right. Yeah, because mm -hmm. it's too hot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's too hot. Yeah. Yeah, and so thinking through those things, I think this is this is a policy tool to make the things we want to have happen happen. So I know it's not in this grant program, but what has become of the stage that we approved money for? Question for the 
was that's coming up. Yeah. I asked so, so I asked the city because we were planning for the fourth of July, and all they said was it it hasn't been purchased. Yet. I, I know it's happening. There, there needs to be follow-up conversations about who is maintaining it, where is it parked, right. how do we do it, the rental agreement, all those things. So I have a to-do list item that we meet with Angie at OCA to talk about. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's actually the going to concert series is coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, even, sure. even when we were looking at the stage, it was a year out. Okay. Yeah, so even when we were looking at it last fall or something like that, saying, oh, we should do this, it was still going to be like 2023 20, before it yeah. was. So it's not going to factor into this yeah. year. Okay. Yeah, good, good reminder. Uh, any other thoughts? No, I agree that Brian needs to be rewritten. Yeah. You know, um, and I, and I can see the way that it was written and the timing, like with the full council and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do for next steps, do you want kind of us as staff to just kind of take a stab at it? And uh, come up with some proposals and bring that to a future meeting. Um, we have a workshop to discuss it. Could you email it out to us? So as written? We, yeah, as written. Yeah, just email it out so we can kind of go through it. And so I'm going to send out. What, what are we? Could you put in a Google Doc? Yeah, yeah well, so I'm going to send then, out. Um, oh, that's a good point. And then we could like make suggestions. Sure. Either way, sending this presentation out. I have no idea how many Google Docs I have under my. <laughs> What's one more? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm going to send this presentation out, and if you click on these links, it'll go to the link as written. Okay. But, but either way, I think if we were to create draft, um, like some new draft documents, we would share it in Google Docs on that. Okay. Anyway, anyway, <laughs> any way that works. For sure. <laughs> I've got San Diego Vice Special Events application. I just have to get my new you know, typewriter ribbon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, that sounds good. Um, any other questions kind of on this or you know, something that we're going to spend a little bit more time on? Uh, I think we're pushing for more. Like, yes, we're saying November through February, but I find that I mean, the community's here year round, but. When are people hanging out that are community oriented? And that's in the summertime when it is, yes, it's very hot, but it's also a time when families are out, they're doing things, they want more community events. So uh, maybe tailoring it to like these are the, the times where there is no events. So the language would say it's, you know, we have tons of events in spring and the fall, and but we don't have any events in winter or the dead of the summer. summer. Yeah. So let's focus on those times when there isn't those outlier events. and more bring more community events, uh, grant you know marketing money to events that are going to be more community oriented for the summertime for families. Yeah, so I do free, I do free movie mobile. Yeah, well, there you go. I, I actually have events theater. during mm -hmm. the summer yeah. outside in the park. Yeah, during, like yeah. right when it's like it's, you, I don't you know, amazing. I actually do do events. Fine, believe man. it or not, are they seeing that seventy percent <laughs> that had to be spent outside of Grand County? Is that per statute? <laughs> Or is that just something that okay? That's per past organizational goals. But to use TRT money, I mean, there's some kind of statute. That yeah, the know. statute is it's it's more that it's this establishing and promoting. Um, like I think that there's you can even peel back the layer of like it doesn't have to be marketing money if it's mm -hmm. coming out of that. So long as you're establishing a new event that's inducing visitation, I think that's still an eligible use. So I think even that can be tracked a little bit too. I think I, I don't think either of those are statutory requirements. So it's just I think keep interpreting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's opportunity to change a little bit there. Because I the thing we're hearing from event organizers is like you know, advertise, but just creating the event is going to bring people here. Yeah, right. We're going to get operational support to hire people to make the event happen. Well, we've even thought like so electric lights for chamber. Yeah. It's like, well, I don't want to spend thousands of dollars. Marketing out. I mean, that's not really something. Right, so but we could make it a better event. Exactly. <laughs> and I think I want to. You know? That's exactly where I'm going to spend this establishing this thing. That's that's the part of the state statute, establishing this stuff. So it doesn't have to just be marketing other people. The, the marketing doesn't have to bring people here. Things that are happening, right? So we have all the collaborate out of Google Apps. 
I can probably do. I will. I will. When we have a draft. I'll send it out. Okay. People can make any edits and all that stuff. But I will say that that's the app. That's the app. That's the best. No, express the cash flow concern as a whole. A large chunk of change for yeah. operating this new thing. So I'm 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 really mindful of getting checked out as fast as possible. However, I do that, and then next step will be thinking of the program. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, right. Next discussion would be the signage, which is the variable message signs, the electronic ones that are on the side of the highway. Um, time entry. Just kind of update on that. August has that. Yeah. So as you've probably seen, in the north of town, uh, right at Courthouse, Wash pull off, and kind of heading south into town, right near Tuna uh, Turnoff. We worked collaboratively got to basically borrow their sign for free because they're kind enough to um, do that and get permits to get through messaging on there, um, get people aware, even if they haven't seen any of our messaging, that if you're driving into town, there's no avoiding it. It sets a level of expectation there, right? However, when we did that, it was kind of a short-term solution. They also could see some benefits from traffic. It's people might be doing erratic traffic behaviors near the arches entrance. They're not aware of what's going on. Uh, they gave us two weeks and they've given us five. So um, I think we've overstayed our UDOT welcome at some level there. Um, you know, they expressed that they'd be happy to do this, but you know, they moved their signs to different places. Um, so we had started to explore you know, substitute options uh, to rent one of those things. costs like $100 a piece. Oh, wow. They're fairly expensive and they're about a little under 20 grand to purchase. So, uh, you know, in terms of the county, like our office, like single handedly doing that, it's a significant cost. That's for one. You know, so if you do 10 weeks, you might look five. five um, we talked to the sheriff's office. Um, they seemed, you know, similar, like yeah, maybe we can help out, but if there's an emergency, we got to use it. Um, so uh, you know, Kate also had indicated that maybe there's like uh, unused DMS sign on arches. I have a video we'll track it down. Right. So maybe not. Um, but also that it's been really useful. So you know, kind of at this point where either deciding this is a priority, either we purchase one or we purchase something in, in partnership with like the sheriff's department or work with the city. I will say when we brought up the sheriff's department, we were like, why are we doing this? Why should MPS should be doing that? Partnering and stuff. Um, but yeah, I kind of want to address that and not overstay our you know, welcome. So even if we had our own sign, we would have to have permission from the doc to put them on the side of the highway. And I don't see that wouldn't be a problem. Because we already got the permitted for the language and the location. So we can use the same permit for just a different sign. I'm not concerned about the parking. I was wondering what everyone was kind of gathering from their guests, like how people are finding out if it's that sign. Like, you have that Kate, or like, now like at your hotels. I haven't had people really ask about the sign. Um, it's kind of half and half. So, some guests are aware of time entry, and then other guests are not, where we have the little flyers um, that we hand them out. If they're not aware, we usually walk them over to our um, like front desk computers, um, business center computers, so they can get a pass. So we show them like, this is where to log in. Sometimes your pass is for the same day. Otherwise tomorrow's a good option sometimes, or let's look to see what options you have. Um, and then same with, if they're calling on the phone, we advise them of timed entry so that they know, oh, you have to have a ticket to get into Arches if you're booking your stay a week from now or two weeks or months from now so that they're aware of that. Um, but I haven't had anyone ask, like tell me specifically it's from the sign. Yeah. How about you, Daniel? Have you seen it? Who do? Uh, basically the same. The sign, I don't ever get any mention on it. I think that's, I've seen it uh, when I drive by. I notice it a lot and I'm very appreciative of it because I do think people see it. But the guests who are coming here, they get here, if they're not aware, if they're, <laughs> maybe this is biased. I mean, I think that if they're, if they haven't figured out that there's a time entry program, they're not going to read the street sign either. <laughs> 
I feel like we've had a sign on the side of the highway every year for like the last four years. I feel like there's always going to be a message to us, whether it's a fire ban, you know, because they have to, yep. we had a fire ban mm -hmm. that went out last year. So this year, if we have a fire ban, we're going to have two signs. You know, no entry. And no was there a sign like two hours to get in the mud with the traffic backed up so long? Yeah. Yeah, there's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was the mask mandate mask, one. Mask mandate. You know, yeah. so, like, <laughs> masks around town. I would feel like UDOT would benefit from, there's like one on I 70, that one right when you get on the freeway right by the thing, the big thing overhead. Yeah. It tells you to buckle up or whatever. Like, would UDOT be willing to? No. We asked them yeah. because that sign they reserve for public safety, like bar none, pretty much, or like super short term, like something else. Mm -hmm. um, they also didn't want to put anything along I 70 uh, because of safety. Along I 70 or along um, 191? That was a lot of it on I 70. <laughs> you're talking, you're, oh, you're saying out again. You're talking about the one that's like permanent. Yeah, yeah, road. yeah, exactly. But 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 it's at like Death Row Point turnoff. Oh, you mean creating like a new one, like in the best town, of the new sign, and then there's like another one coming the other way. Yeah. It seems like you always have some. I see. What I, I don't want to sign, but also too, it was a pretty obnoxious mm -hmm. landscape, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. I mean, kind of, yeah. but it's already obnoxious, right? With the sign on the side of the road that's been there for four years. Yeah. So so um, was it a UDOT sign? It was just like for the mask mm -hmm. mandate and all of that. Was that a UDOT sign? No, so a, so that was yeah, um, either the city, it was either city public works or uh, city public or sheriff. So, so there's there are other signs out there, um, but you know it's we can make the ask, but if it comes down from the city council, like I'm sure they're more likely for that to actually happen. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah. So because they obviously they need to use their resources as they see fit. So really, is it? It's is there going to be a Tourist related message that we need right. to pass this Arches pilot program. I don't see as a big loss, but Kate, do you know if your staff has, you know, if it'd be a loss to you guys if we don't purchase one or keep our rent in mind? I, you know, I, I kind of tend to agree that I'm not sure how many people really are mm -hmm. looking at it, looking yeah. at it and, and absorbing it, yeah. but it is useful whenever someone says, why didn't you put up a sign? And then we can say, well, you passed two. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is, it, it, it's really yeah. just covering the bus. Right, it really is. Yeah. There's no excuse. Like, yeah. like at least it's a no sign. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, who pays for the, like, there's one in Mesa, like, in, um, when you go into Mesa Verde for the big ones, so like Mesa Verde open and Mesa Verde closed. And then right. that's a, a permanent, yeah. you know, like wildfire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I imagine that's that's probably NPS. I think that I just really need to um, sit down with our law enforcement chief and just be like, okay, I heard there was another VMS board. Where is this thing? Because I've been asking around and nobody seems to know where it is. But if we can find that other board, then we board. yeah, we can put it up at Coral Splash because that's a great spot for it. Mm -hmm. so, um, I don't know if we could use some of our funds. You know, we do have a time to entry pool of money, but we'd have to submit an aid request maybe. But I don't know, we could maybe contribute to the purchase of a- Yeah, I mean, we could partner. Right. Possibly. Yeah, maybe. Aid request. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the timeline on an aid request? Well, it's usually pretty quick, so. They're partners in the aid. Mm -hmm. The best. <laughs> so why don't, yeah, I, I will look into this a little bit more and see what additional options we might have. But I agree that we've taken advantage of UDOT at this point. And, you know, they've, I, we're grateful for it, but we don't want to, you know, prevent them from using that elsewhere if they need it. So. I just get that. So. And I guess the only other possibility, you know, is like city public works, possibly. Like, I don't know. I assume it's like not exercising it. 
talk to the sheriff. So like, yeah, we have to sign for this, but uh, I don't know. But I don't, again, don't want to lose anything. So that's the only other. I don't think we got to purchase too much of the way. Um, it was like we just kind of inhabited the corner of the back then. Yeah. Scaling was good. This email hurts that we can hear to ask. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like we'll at least maybe try those options out first before. <laughs> Buy something, and then I do want to talk to you guys and say thank you so much. If you if you're fine with keeping this here, we'll let you keep it. But please take it away if you keep it elsewhere. Maybe there's an associate uh, president. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if they disappear, we can figure something else out. We can figure out if they're really. Yeah. <laughs> So we'll keep working on it, but I just wanted to bring it up because we got we got it. If we wanted to move on it, it's expensive. Yeah. Not are we okay with just going away? But we're not quite yet. It's nature. Okay. Great. Hey. Besides winter events, take yourself a grant. So Chris and I worked hard to try to pull out of our rather archaic accounting uh, software uh, some numbers that line up with eligible use of TRT and TRCC um, in state code. So I, I looked into this a little bit. Um, there's a part of the TRT law that says that the county should submit a report to the state, the tourism tax advisory board, um, office of tourism, like the office of the fiscal budget analyst, or something like that. I checked, and our office hasn't submitted one since 2017. Uh, and so, like, has not, my understanding is that Elaine Hall has been updating this board based off of what money she's been spending before I was here, but it wasn't, there's never an annual report. To my knowledge. Um, so this is something that I had prioritized and then you know, deleted other things and then had to reprioritize for me uh, in a good way, I think. So um, we have some draft uh, reports that I can share. Uh, again, I need to go back through this with a fine tooth comb to make sure we haven't missed anything here, but this is fairly close to. Uh, um, so this is for TRT, yeah, for TRT and TRCC, and we did 2020 and 2021 to start. So this is, I honestly, we only finished this today, so you can ask me any questions you have, and I'll try to follow up. Um, so total transient room tax revenues in 2020 amounted to a little under four and a half million dollars, um, and there from the previous year, was a little over half a million dollars in the fund balance. Um, I'm not sure about the state out of state spend, honestly, so I'm going to ignore that for now. But uh, I mean, this is basically lined up right with state statute, just for reference. So TRT was used for establishing and promoting tourism in an amount of $1.2 million, recreation, $13,000, film production, $97,000. And this was our contribution to the film commission when it was a city. Um, zero for conventions and zero for economic diversification activity. This actually didn't even exist in 2020. Um, everything else on here is technically out of like the mitigation side of things. So it isn't out of um, anything I spend money on. Um, so is there information center consent or maybe that is? That goes to um, the MIC, that's our contribution to the MIC, I believe. Um, this is a uh, contribution to the Mod Museum. Uh, this is money going to waste disposal, so the solid waste uh, district, special district. Uh, contribution to search and rescue, contribution to the sheriff's office. Um, so total, total expenditure, three and a half million, um, 900,000, 
not expended out of what was received in that year, uh, putting the fund balance at $1.7 million. Uh, TRCC, um, so a reminder, I guess, if this is making you ask the question of really how, what is TRT and TRCC and what can we spend it on? Um, something I've been thinking before we do another year of budget recommendation is to have Natalie Randall from UPA do um, an education kind of session with our body to make sure that we're experts on TRT and TRCC uh, law and how that works. Um, and if you're confused, don't worry, it's unbelievably complicated and there's lots of percentages um, that, are, that are different. So TRCC is 7% on rental cars um, and OHVs. Fairly sure they're interchangeable and not stackable, but um, that question came up recently. I didn't get a final answer on that. Um, and 1% on restaurants, but they all get spent on the same thing. So they could be spent on financing tourism promotion, um, which my understanding is like, if you're, if you're borrowing money to do tourism promotion stuff, you can help pay off the bond with this, this money. But this has been spent to support the airport, um, convention facilities, I believe is the Grand Center and the Old Spanish Trail Arena. So that's the majority of the expenditures of TRCC. Is that just like maintenance of those? It's the entire facility? staff, um, any, yeah, any maintenance. The Grand Center here? Here, yeah. So this is this is funded in part by, I think in entirety by TRCC and OSIS funding, mm -hmm. I think in entirety by TRCC. And that's not anything that's not like PG there. Yeah, I don't think the Grand Center the Grand Center does for special events too, doesn't it? Rent out from weddings and all sorts of things. Yeah, I don't totally know, but I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't think it's very big in my budget. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what the cultural facility is here. But again, so it's about a million in, in uh, TRCC expenditures, 64 grand unspent. So that left a balance of 240,000 in TRCC at the end of 2020. So carrying into 2021, there's a balance of, in fund balance, a little under $2 million in TRT reserves and a little under about a quarter million dollars in TRCC reserves. So if OHV is stackable, will it be added to that TRCC pot? That's where we go. Yeah. So 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 my understanding is that they created they created two separate categories, a rental car, seven percent. And it's it's weird. There's actually like separate laws for a three percent and a four percent for the exact same for rental cars. So I think it got passed a different time. Okay. And then the seven percent, I think, is supposed to be identical, but it's for OHV rentals. Because I think to clarify any, if you like, well, this is not a rental car. Mm -hmm. This is a recreation activity. They wanted to capture it in that way to say they're interchangeable. So my understanding could be wrong is that they're not, they are interchangeable. They're not 14% of your rental car. Could be wrong. That's my understanding. 18.25. Well, yeah. And then there's all the other <laughs> general oh, yeah. sales <laughs> in your sense. <laughs> We're just talking about a little corner of that clock. Um, 2020 to 2021, surprise, surprise, double. So huge change in TRT revenues. Um, the, the number was, let me just double check it. Um, yes, yeah, four, four and a half million went up to a little under $9 million. So huge increase. Again, this is revenue. So, you know, it's not necessarily tied to occupancy of any particular thing or place, um, which is something I want to dive into. But again, so here's that number, unspent from the previous year, a little under $2 million. Um, one interesting thing, again, how TRT works is that the, the, what you can, the, the way that you can spend it is based off of what you've received in that year. So the budgeting is bizarre. You have to forecast how, money, how much money you think you're going to get next year and budget based off of that forecast. And you only get dinged if the future changed and you couldn't predict it. So you have to revise your budgets if um, you know the TRT anticipated TRT revenues are going to meet what you expect. So everything that I'm planning this year, and then we don't even get we're like all of that information is lagged, so we don't get TRT 
Fly check for Sterling. First thing. Oh. Did we ever get one? Yeah. Thing? One of that? Mm -hmm. Was it more lags or anything like that? So, you know, we don't even know until 2023 if we were wrong for 2022. But just, you know, keep that in mind. Um, so we're 2021 spent about a million on establishing and growing tourism. Higher number for recreation. A lot of that was for the trail ambassador program. So there really wasn't money that was going towards you know, the trails department to do more than just the base you know, what Tyson was doing out on the trail to make the stuff and making all the mountain bikes happy. Uh, that's the, sorry, that's the recreation. That's the recreation, yeah. And there's a couple other things in there, the, the contribution to the largest hotspot recreation transportation pilot, that's where that comes out of. Uh, this again is the uh, contribution to film production last year, so sending that money to the city before Gigi was with us. I guess she was with us. Um, this is the first year we see the economic diversification activity pop up. This is largely last year, just um, mostly like staffed. And so we just had to do a formula of each of the staff people in our office, what percent of their time they're spending on, on not important stuff. So when I started, I was only doing that work. So that's my salary, it's a percentage of Ben's salary and Rob's and Robert's salary, et cetera. So that's where that number comes from. Going forward, this is where that grant money all of those other programs. So that number should increase next year. Um, visitor Information Center, contribution to the MIC, contribution to the museum, waste, search and rescue, law enforcement. So that huge oh, increase. Huge. So, um, you know, again, that's kind of out of my world, but that was something that stood out to me. Um, so, total charity expenditures. We tried to spend it, but we didn't spend it all. So, we spent about $7 million total as a county, um, a little under $2 million not expended from what was generated. Uh, so in reserves, about $4 million. So that's actually, there's a statutory limit. You can only have 50% in your fund balance of what you got the last year. So uh, you have to spend money for the first. So something to keep in, in, in mind that Chris was thinking about. Sure, we're in compliance with state law. <clears throat> TRCC again. <clears throat> um, here are the collections. Uh, you know, more restaurant, even though the restaurant tax is 1%, the current tax is 7%, the, the, the total revenue from restaurants is much higher. So you can imagine that restaurant total activity is much higher than that collectivity coming in with that quarter million dollars from last year. Uh, Convention facilities again, this is Grand Center and OSTA. It's cultural facilities, um, recreation facilities. So total spend out of TRCC. Do we help with the uh, our arts and recreation? So that's always one in the mark. Do we help sure. with that? You know what? That's city. I know it's city, yeah. but we all should find to contribute. You know, we, we all. We got, they were going to bring us a request last year. Yeah. They wanted to get the um, anyway, total expenditure was one and a half million dollars left behind six grand. So in that balance is a little bit. Of so again, there's a pretty like significant increase in prevention facility. So if, if there's no like upgrade, is that like all salary increase? Do we know? That's what? a question for. for but I wish one of them had a roof. Yeah, that's true. There was right. a roof. Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. big. That was real big. But since we have such a large, like, outstanding balance here, isn't this enough for the screen or the, the stage? stage? Yeah, I don't know if that got like accounted for in 2021 budget year or if that came out of two or no, again. Oh, it was budgeted last year for this year. It was in last year's budget for this year. It is budgeted for this budget year. Yeah. So I don't know if that got extended last year. So again, mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. Um, no, on, on TR's, um, TRT, um, part of that is supposed to be earmarked. What are the three of, I can't remember the percentage, two of one quarter, one eighth on a full moon. Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, yeah. Yeah. I can, I can speak to that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, 
I, I imagine that's at 978 or whatever. What I'm wondering is that doesn't get spent and it gets put into the fund balance. Even in the fund balance, is that amount that didn't get spent earmarked for advertising? Right. Like if it comes back out of the reserve, yes. still does it still earmark that it has to be used for advertising? I would think so because that's that's the law. Yeah, right. I would think so too. I just be, I, yeah. Yeah. percentage. Yeah, and do we know those first? I mean, it'd be good to know those yeah. kind of those too. Like what's yeah. left. Once yeah. it goes into the fund balance, it's just like well, because the way I think that it's like it would be considered if, if it's coming out of reserves, it's like an input into the system. Mm -hmm. And so what we're what the state requires us to report is based off of and what the rules are based off of so what is what is the revenue generated given here? I bet I know the cultural. The the do we don't we pay for a lot great deal of the art, the statues and the art art trails trail. comes out of recreation. Oh. You don't do anything with the multicultural center themselves, like Mohawk that's Valley that's given through our uh, our you know the gifts that we give to nonprofits. Mm -hmm. That's not uh, TRT at all. But to, to answer your question, Jason, um, I don't know. Okay. I'm surprised we spent less last year on out of state. Well, again, I don't know what's out of state and state. For I'm like, not sure this promotions. is actually. Yeah, I don't. I when don't we brought know. in so much more revenue, it seems like that number should be a lot higher than it is. Like relative to the 2020. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. well, we I did 1.2 the year before, and but yet we made half of what we did. So it seems like there's we're like we didn't use a lot of our TRT for marketing purposes. Right. 2020. 2021. 2021. 21. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that bears out. I mean, it was a time of. Yeah, I wasn't quite right. That was COVID, so it makes sense. But can you speak to why um, Nick gets um, a third of what the museum gets? Nope. As in, I I don't know. Why. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's probably what they request. Yeah, I'm almost sure all if they come and ask for someone. someone. No. Do you want to raise share? As far as my thing here, that is what that is the amount that the chapter fund. It's always been that amount. And I mean, it went up a little bit, but that's always been what it was, and that's just what they that's what they said. That's what we give you. Um, we don't. We always just request at least what we got before. Right. Um, be interesting also to get like reports like what Sharon does for the Mick, you know, like from a museum, like what they sell and things like that. So I'm just kind of a little bit surprised to see those numbers when she right. gives us like well, yeah, why the 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 Utilities and all that, we pay for all of that. Too. Most of the contribution is back. And I, and I think technically, the like the visitor information center money is, I think this might be counted slightly incorrectly. I think this actually does come from the tourism side or should be counted there. Um, and that the museums comes out of a different, they come out of different pots of money. The museum is like a technically, it's not in the establishment no, side. I'm not saying that it should be any particular amount, but uh, is there any way that we could look into getting that? Because I mean, it's like really old, but what you would give us, like, get that from the museum, like, counts. And <laughs> I sent down a whole bunch of numbers from 2011 <laughs> on. <laughs> the, the question there is trying to understand the value of the museum, understand the value of the event based on Yeah, if you want to do it. Yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I would be interested to see why there's a huge discrepancy yeah. from year over year for the police. But yeah. I agree that the police needs to get that much money. I well, absolutely. Sure. Like yeah, they sure. need it, but, but it would be interesting to see like had, is it salary based or is it I think I think I can see or did they that. add on yeah, more people? Were, we had gone so long without having way, way understaffed. That's good then. So they added more people. Yeah. And we couldn't get anybody to apply. 
Right. And so they had to do a significant pay increase to get people to apply. Awesome. And they're still understaffed. Yeah. But they're not as bad as they were. But yes, it's, it's a, mm -hmm. Yeah, we still have <laughs> 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 to We do all the training. We spend all the money on the training. And you guys would steal them. So I'm going to just give you these. If you have questions about any of this, follow up and we'll try to. I think the best way is like. We'll try to and I don't know if you know this or not, but do you know? So this is every piece of TRT. It's not like, I and mean, this is all the department that goes to. There's no. Because I guess there's like a mitigation side and you know all yeah, of that. Yeah, so it's funny some of the language that gets thrown around yeah. for what represents what yeah. is subjective. So like nowhere in the state code does it say like this is the mitigation bucket. Right. It's just like that's what we call the like 63%. The 63% is just everything that's not an establishment promote. This establishment promote is 37%. And then recreation film and convention can be um, up to one fifth of that 37%, and this can be up to one third of that 37%, and then this could be all of the 37% if you didn't want to spend the other two on full moon. <laughs> um, but I think just to make sure we get to the other things on our agenda, I'll, I'll put this and make sure this gets sent out. Um, yes, I don't, I'm not gonna, we're not, I'm not gonna put my full faith behind these numbers because I think it still needs to be revised. So not make them out. Yeah. It also doesn't it, talk about the amount of money that film production actually brings in, in, in TRT right, right. taxes, yeah. which is huge, you know, hundred thousand times more than that money that is spent on that. But just you know, yeah, no, it's like, <laughs> absolutely. yeah. So I mean, yes. you know, what's not in here is why, what's making a revenue number, right? And, and that's actually probably a good transition to the next section, talking about right. the stuff that I do. So. We'll go to that next update on the STR market. Did you have a hand up? Then you're on deck. So the, um, the last two bullets are kind of the document that we're working on. They're kind of the same thing. Um, so I'm happy to talk about occupancy data and then we can just talk about data data. I'm seeing now I'm seeing a no tag. Oh. Oh, I know what I did. There you go. Okay, now I'll get you seeing that thing. Yep. Okay, great. So um, in the handout that I sent, uh, that I handed out, uh, um, <laughs> uh, we have uh, I'm not seeing this on the screen. I'm just representing the agile for you guys. It's not on a data class. Oh my God. You want to share your window. That's what I tried to do. I'm done for you, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Okay, thank you. So um, if we look at occupancy, um, things were just a, a little down in April. Um, I'm not really gonna try to explain why. I think that's more of a, a group effort, um, but I just wanted to put together this chart and a few other charts. So the star reports that we get, um, they changed the format on us a few months ago, and I think it's horrendous now. And that and requests from the community have been pushing me to just create a monthly report of all the different data sets we have. Our star reports are the one that people want to read about most, so I'm probably gonna front load the reports with that. So the handout you have is a draft and I would love feedback on how you think the format is going so far. Um, this is not something that I've 
put out to the community yet, but the numbers are correct. Um, so you're welcome to share those and ask if you have further questions. Um, but the, the general picture is that occupancy was down, ADR continues to rise. Um, now I know that ADR is kind of a, a, a touchy thing because there's so many things that factor into that. There are market forces, there's inflation of the dollar at any given time, not just right now. Um, but I thought it was really important to kind of consider that, you know, if you look at 2013, the ADR for April was $108 and the average occupancy was 66%. So as you can see, you know, ADR has increased over 100% in 10 year period, while occupancy is increasing by about 10 to 13 percentage points on average for April. Um, so this is data we get, we do have it broken down by month and I'm glad to circulate those month numbers as well. And I think that this will definitely tie into that discussion about how do we create a better events grant program for the community that really targets times when folks are in town, maybe visitors are not in town and people are looking for local programming. So that's really the only update I had on occupancy specifically. Does anyone have any other questions? And if not, I can just talk about the rest of what I have. I would so, just oh, go ahead. Yeah. I would just add one comment. Part of the thing that's affecting ADR in April versus last year, Jeep Safari was only in half of April last year, whereas this year we had the full two weeks and that will have a dramatic impact on ADR. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we definitely saw not just ADR, but occupancy rising in March, uh, year over year. So that was definitely something that we were, we were thinking about when we looked at this because both March and April looked different than last year, but for different reasons. Um, what were you saying? I was just saying, so we, we could get this um, snapshot of like an entire year. You have all of that. Yes. So it, we can. <laughs> it's, it's a little tricky. So um, I have month averages back through January of 2013. Okay. I have your day-to-day -day occupancy reliably through fall of 2020. So in about September or October, I can start reporting on each day. This was the occupancy, this was the ADR, this was the revenue, um, supply and demand. But before that, we just have month averages, which are still pretty helpful, yeah, yeah. but it would be nice to get that historic data. I am not sure if it exists, to be perfectly honest, because they've really changed how they track things and it's, it's much better now, but um, the data outputs are a little bit uglier. So. I really wanted to put this together because they will segment their data when they send it to us based on weeks. They kind of determine how those weeks look. And so you can look at a chart and get a completely different understanding, I think, than what was the actual situation. But I think this is a little clearer that, you know, overall, um, people coming in April seem to come year after year and they come around the same times in April mm -hmm. because you see that those trends are consistent, but still things were just a little bit lower on the whole. Mm -hmm. right. So I guess one thing we I, we're not super interested in like a revenue impact from GFT because it's you know occupancy is lower, the rates are higher, but who is getting the distributional impacts of that? I think is the bigger question. If you have less people, does that mean less people in restaurants? If you have, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe people are moving to Airbnbs rather than conventional. Hotels. I was going to say, and, and is it just that how many rooms have we added? You right. Know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, exactly. We've got it in the market. We've dispersed. A lot. I mean, yeah. to, I mean, considering that we're still sitting around the sixty and seventy percent with how many rooms have we added, still suggests we've grown a lot. Right. And Airbnbs are not calculated towards TRT, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But they're not reflected in this it, date. Exactly. This right. is hotel start date. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we we currently don't have. Uh, reliable source for basically the same data, but for Airbnbs, but that's something we're looking at because we did have that previously with Love and that's just part of contract stuff that we need to work out to get that data back. Uh, but this is kind of like the industry standard that people use all over. I'm kind of curious, like, is there data that where this would kind of coincide with, with general sales tax, you know, mm -hmm. so you can see like, you know, if you can see like, oh, TRT's up, people are staying in hotels, but sales tax is down, you know, meaning people are spending room in the 
hotel rooms that are not fitting in the gym right. shop yeah. or yeah. restaurant or, or mm -hmm. maybe that's a bad example, but you yeah. know, seeing how it tracks across the stay of someone, you know, being in town. Sure. Know, would be so interesting too. I, I would love to see that data as well. Yeah. I, I think that's more of a question for August and Chris. I don't really they can do that. Yeah. So so that's what I was gonna get to. Um so when it comes to the taxes that are coming in, I know there's a quite a bit of a delay when we get that data. And I personally don't know how it's plotted, if it's plotted by day, if it's plotted by collection period. But if I were to get that data, I'd absolutely like to integrate it. Um, we did just get our uh, visa uh, destination insights uh, platform kind of restarted for us. It reports on a quarterly cadence, but we're gonna move our subscription to monthly. So that means at the end of the month following, we'll be able to get data on the previous month. So at the end of May, we're going to have April's data, and that's going to give us a snapshot of what they say is about 60% of the credit card market. So it can give us an idea of where people are spending. Are they spending it more on retail, restaurants, stuff like that? And that's definitely going to make its way into these reports right now. I do have that data through March. So if you've got questions about that, I'm glad to look into it, but I just didn't include it here because we just don't have April yet, and I know that's one of people's minds. This is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. This is thanks. thanks. Really really great. Yeah, that's great. So, so, um, so this is, yeah, this is just a start, and I'm definitely open to feedback and what people would like to see, different sort of call-outs, because I don't really see our job as trying to interpret the data as much as just present it, but obviously, you know, if you've got a line chart right here, I don't want to put every plot in point on there, but I do want to say what was the high, what was the low compared to things like year over year. Um, some other pieces of data, Sharon shared with me uh, MIG numbers. I'm really excited to have those because I think that we can start comparing MIG numbers, Arches Visitor Center and Arches Total Entry and try and figure out what do they say about each other. Um, as I put down here, you know, um, average number on record um, before today, I only had through 2017. With Sharon's addition, I'm going to be able to look back to 2011. But I did think it was really interesting that if you look at the change from March to April of this year, in the past five years, that was the biggest jump that the mix saw from March to April. I would guess probably having something to do with time entry. I'm not sure, um, but people, more people were coming. Our April numbers went went up really high. I mean, we're getting a lot of, and a lot of it is time to entry. A lot of people are coming there. We have a park ranger there. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing a lot more groups coming in. Mm -hmm. um, today, we had a whole school from um, Northern Springs. I have a classroom that actually seventh and eighth graders from Northern Springs came in. Um, they're going to down to the needles to go camping and hiking. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's not not so, so, you know, they came in to watch the movie and they ate their lunch out on the grass and great. Um, did they park in the right spot? <laughs> yeah, actually, they did. I love that. They <laughs> did park in the right place. Okay. Um, but no, it's we're, we're seeing a lot of a lot of. I mean, it's busy in there almost all day long now. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm just I'm excited to kind of start putting apples and oranges together and see you know what we can deliver to the community. Um, this right here, this data is all available through the NPS websites. Um, Kate, uh, actually, Sharon sent this to me as well. Kate gave me some of those trends that I was talking about in the January through March that she also shared with us today. Um, so those are great, but again, I'm going to try and package them in these reports that way people can kind of just have one place to go. Um, can I say something yeah, really quick about this? Um, this Arches National Park, that's in the side of VC. The reason 2021 is still low, 2020 and 2021, the park rangers were outside. Mm -hmm. So the only people coming in were the people that were actually coming into the store. Mm -hmm. So that's visitors that are not visitation. Right, to correct. Park. Yeah, and that's just this reason. Yeah. But yeah, overall so visitation, which you have that the down below, is, I think it's from the entrance station, isn't it? You just have uh, this. Yeah, the, the ones down below, that's from the entrance station. I don't have April's numbers yet. Right. Yeah. We're all eagerly um, and then, yeah, the last thing I'll do is, is just show you that um, I'm making Robert and Melissa's life really fun, but uh, they do all these cool things in the travel council side of things that we can turn into data. Um, obviously, with how marketing on the travel council side of things has changed, the leads are down and it may not be a great indicator of who we can expect to see, but it's still, I think, interesting to see who wants to come here. 
And so I'm going to start try, trying to you know, gather that data and compare it year over year, month to month. Uh, where are we getting those requests from? And then something I didn't include in here that I may not include until timed entry is over is analytics from Discover Moab. Um, we can see who's visiting what pages and how long they're spending. Um, so I, this kind of arose from the question of was Jeep Safari slow or not. I looked at Discover Moab and the numbers for the UTV and the Jeep and the Jeep Safari pages were all down year over year, big time. Um, but I didn't want to put that in there because it could be a little misleading. We are really pushing timed entry on Discover Moab more than anything else. But following timed entry, Discover Moab is still the number one place that people go when they're planning their trip. So I think in the future, you can expect analytics on who's looking at what and when. Um, and yeah, just um, this is, you know, the, the numbers should be correct, but there's still more that I want to put into this before we kind of put it out there. So if you have feedback on how data can be presented well, questions that you have or that you get from your guests or from your employees, we definitely want to take that into account. I would love to see data on um, international visitation as it continues to potentially come back to Moab. Because so that's such a huge market. Here. <laughs> so, so even for our leads uh, this year, we have a lot, a lot of Canadians right. may request mm -hmm. uh, the Which should be awesome. travel guide. Mm -hmm. And I went to Canada last, last month. Mm -hmm. And since I went to come in Canada, we have a lot of leads from Awesome. Canadians, even probably a day we have between five to ten Canadians a day apply a request for the awesome. And I can do guide. the same math for, for the US. Yeah, that would be awesome. It's nice to visualize. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Can this be made available on um, the kind of website? That's that's the plan is that once we make this, uh, my plan is to make this a, a monthly thing that will be. Uh, on the county website and probably in email subscriber list. Uh, but yeah, this is totally meant to be public and be easily easily accessible. And then have it sign up for that um, monthly, would that be through Discover Moab? What I think we're going to do, we have a pretty good email marketing list. And so I think once this report is ready to get on a monthly cycle, we'll probably send it out through that list and just offer for people to opt out if they want, because I'm sure all of you are part of that list. Um, as, as well as a ton of other employers in the community. Awesome. The only thing I would awesome. add is that we will be having, uh, moving towards hopefully um, kind of the, one of the industry leaders and, and did, uh, um, dashboards for this kind of stuff called Clarico, which was developed out of someone who used to work for the office tourism. <coughs> um, we've been obviously working with Love's team to kind of create their own their own platform called Amplify with pros and cons for either, but I think the desire to have kind of higher uh, usability on our end to mix and match data and kind of different analysis and then they have uh, comes with kind of like insight people so you can have kind of them do an analysis of the data monthly and then you can ask more questions. They also have um, really good geographic data so starting to understand not only in town, but in the backcountry, based off of people using Gaia and Onyx and all that kind of stuff. You know, where are people? Where are people coming from that are going to these events? Mm -hmm. um, I think we're really and starting to kind of take these more nuanced looks at questions like what weekend specifically should we be building this stuff out of? Uh, for example, how it's been used in the past is both up in Ogden. We're seeing huge uses at a reservoir um, for the town. Uh, it would be like a local hotspot. And all of a sudden, it's super busy. And they're like, oh, Davis County and Azure County come and take in our, our spot. And they, they use um, the GPS data to show that it's actually all county residents that are using this. Uh, and the DMO used that to justify, said, hey, maintenance of this park should not come out of my marketing budget. It should actually, or the scare key funding, it should actually come out of like general county operations for public citizen uses. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that kind of like really high level. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can you update on the Easter Jeep Safari visitor? Do you want to cover that in the yeah, so it, the gist of it is I'm I'm working on putting together this report just for every month. 
Um, we can certainly do something in zero in on Jeep Safari, but right now everything we have available for Jeep Safari is in here. We're eagerly awaiting that visa data to kind of put together the spending habits and see maybe that says something about what people were spending on versus staying in. Because um, the occupancy is low, but I think there's something missing there. And, uh, the visa will help with that. Um, but I'm glad to do, you know, uh, graphs if that helps, or just give you know like raw data on the days that Jeep Safari actually were. So if you really want to zero in on that, I'm glad to send that out. Thanks.